Hi, and welcome back to our CNT 140 lecture, LAN Wiring. This lesson will be discussing the telecommunications room terminations. The objectives that we need to cover in this lesson are the 110 and 66 punch down blocks, uh, the other connecting systems, routing and uh, addressing devices, um, fiber optic termination, marking, and workmanship. Now, the telecommunications room is another important area in the chain of wiring devices that makes up a structured LAN wiring installation. The telecommunications room, or TR, is the point of termination of all of the horizontal run cables that go from the TR to the workstation areas, as well as the cables that interconnect to the other TRs. The TR uh, typically contains the punch down blocks and the patches, which we'll discuss next in Chapter 8 and then other termination and wire routing devices that are necessary for the interconnection of horizontal and backbone cabling. It may also contain various types of equipment such as wiring hubs, routers, and even network servers. All the wiring termination methods and devices described in this lesson apply uh, as well to similar wiring facilities including the main cross-connect, intermediate cross-connect, and the equipment room and entrance facility. In a generalized model of universal structure cabling, the TR also may contain telephone switching and distribution equipment, much of which we've been discussing with your bid projects. Now, much of what we cover in this lesson will be equally applicable to the telephone wiring, and, but we will emphasize the LAN wiring aspects wherever possible. It is interesting that the TR is one place where the differing needs of telephone and LAN wiring are most apparent. The very uh, strict length and workmanship guidelines that are required for a successful LAN wiring system are uh, <clears throat> very much relaxed if you are installing telephone wiring. For example, telephone wiring is often run through the multiple sets of punch down blocks in several wiring closets with little regard to total distance or care in the routing. Although the TIA standards do have strict guidelines, they are often excessively strict for telephone uh, connections. The much lower audio frequencies of most telephone installations allow these signals to run thousands of meters on very loosely twisted pairs. However, if you intend for your wiring system to be general purpose so that you can run either voice or network signals, you must design your system to meet the more stringent operating rules embodied in the TIA or similar ISO standards. LAN wiring requires strict adherence to length, routing, rating, and workmanship rules to operate properly and the extra requirements for LAN operation are really the determining factors in the design of a modern structured wiring system. In this lesson, we're going to cover all the types of termination and routing devices except patch panels that are used in the TR. Uh, patch panels, jumpers, and cross connects are covered in the next chapter. Uh, in higher category cabling systems, it is very common to terminate horizontal cables directly into a patch panel. However, the termination blocks used will very likely be a variation of the 110 style connecting block described in this lesson. In addition, uh, we'll also cover some of the mounting location issues of the TR, including the options for locating hub uh, uh, equipment. So let's talk about punch down blocks. The fundamental component for copper wiring termination is the TR, or in the TR, is the punch down block. And the punch down block can take many forms and has over the years evolved into a rather complex uh, system component. Punch down can even be incorporated into a patch panel, but we'll talk about that later. Now there are two main types of punch down blocks common uh, in common use. The 110 block and the older 66M block. Both originated by AT&T. Both types are now offered by a number of companies and versions of these uh, block terminations are incorporated into many products, including the outlet connectors and patch panels. These two punch down types dominate the installed and new markets, so we'll cover them in some detail. We'll also cover a couple of proprietary punch down systems that are available from only one manufacturer or are not as widely used. The first one is the Type 10 connecting blocks. It's the most popular style cable termination block for structured wiring from CAT5E to CAT6 and the AC6. And this is the 110 connecting block. The 110 style block is a relatively 
uh, is a relative newcomer compared to the older 66 described in the next section. Even so, it has been in use for over three decades. The 110 system is designed for higher wire density and uh, a better separation of input and output cables than the older system. The 110 system is also important because the four pair connecting block component is used for the installation, displacement, termination in many patch panel and outlet jack systems by many manufacturers. Final index strips that organize and secure 25 pair 50 wires each. These blocks are available that accommodate 100 and 300 pair. The 100 pair block has four horizontal index strips and the 300 block has 12. The 110A wiring block has a three and a quarter inch depth from the mounting plane, uh, plane and is used in normal applications. The empty space below the block makes feeder cable uh, routing easy. A 110D block is available with a uh, 1.4 inch depth of, for low profile special applications. The 300 pair wiring block uh, illustrates the potential wiring density of the 110 system and it accommodates all 300 pair in a 10 and 3 quarter inch square footprint. The 110T disconnect block is also available that provides the ability to disconnect circuit for testing in either direction. Space is available between the index strips to neatly organize the incoming cables. In addition, the tip, secondary colors, um, are marked on the strips uh, to help the installer. Uh, place those wires in the block. The wiring block does not make electrical contact with cable pairs, but merely secures them in place. Once the incoming cable wires are routed into the wiring block, they are electrically terminated by the uh, insertion of a 110C connecting block. The 110C connecting block is a small wafer-like plastic housing containing metal contact clips at opposite edges as shown here behind me. Now the blocks are designed to snap onto the wiring block strip and then connect uh, to the wires that are held in place. The back edge of the wafer contains a quick clip IDC prongs that resemble the uh, straight portion of the one of the 66 blocks clips. <clears throat> when the connecting block is pressed into place on the wiring block, the wires positioned on the wiring block are then terminated in mass. Each connecting block can terminate from 3 to 5 pair, 6 to 10 wires, depending upon the size of the block. The front edge of the 110C connecting block is used to, uh, is used to uh, terminate cross-connect wires, uh, or occasionally other cables and adapters. It is color-coded to assist in the placement of the wires, which are then terminated on the top of the block one at a time. The IDC clips in the 110 block are uh, designed to slice through the installation of the, uh, as the space is available between the index strips to neatly organize the incoming cables. In addition, the tip or secondary colors are marked on the strips to help the installer place wires in the block. The wiring block does not make electrical contact with the cable pairs but merely secures them in place. Once the incoming cable wires are routed into the wiring block, they are electronically terminated by the insertion of a 110C connecting block. The IDC clips in the 110 block are designed to slice through the insulation as these connectors. The incoming station wires are inserted and trimmed using a 788 uh, type impact tool shown here behind me. And this tool can insert and trim up to five pair, 10 wires at a time on the wiring block. It also seats the 110C connecting block onto the wiring block position. Cross-connect wires are terminated and trimmed one at a time using a punch down tool that has a 110 type blade. A 110 block system is used to terminate multi-pair station cables and allow the cross connection to other punch down locations. A typical lay installation might have an, an appropriate number of wall mounted or rack mounted 110 blocks with cross-connect jumpers to a patch panel. Distribution frame assemblies are available that have pre-terminated uh, 25 pair multi-conductor cables connected to the back positions of the connection blocks. The multi-conductor cables terminate in 50 pin telco connectors that may provide mass connections to hub, telephone, or other equipment. 
Now, as we talked about before, each horizontal strip of the wiring block unit contains positions for 50 wires or 25 pair. This strip, in many ways, corresponds to one side of the 66 block, using the same match we did for 66 block, or same math we did for 66 blocks. The 110 strip can accommodate six individual four pair station cables, or eight each three pair cables, or 12 each two pair. It can also terminate one 25 pair cable. As with other types of block, uh, 50 is an odd number for four pair cables, so the last two positions then would not be needed. Only 48 positions would be used. Contacts on adjacent 110 block strips may be uh, connected together uh, one position at a time by using the 110 type patch plug. The plug stretches vertically between two rows and connects the corresponding positions without having to use jumper wires. The plugs correspond to the bridging clips and are used to connect clips in adjacent columns on the 66 block. In general, the 110 system is suitable for CAT 5V and 6 or AC6, uh, as well as lower categories. This is due to the smaller geometry of the 110 clip and the ease of maintaining pair twist up to the very point of termination. Still, workmanship is an important consideration. Uh, terminating the wires on the 110 block is an individual operation and the individual doing the termination must be properly trained and sufficiently methodical. The station wires at the back of the connecting block are more difficult to inspect than those on the front, so care has to be taken to maintain good quality terminations. The 110 connecting block is also an important component in many outlet jacks and patch panels. It has the advantage of being extremely quick and easy to use. In addition to providing high quality connection, you can probably terminate a 110 block in half the time it takes with many custom IDC types, even though you must use a 110 punch down tool. The comparison to conventional screw terminations is even better. The ready availability of 110 tools makes the block ideal for outlet and patch uh, uses because it is likely to be any installer's tool, tool pouch. The quality of the connection is an issue for these jacks, just as it is for the wiring closet terminations. The 110 block allows you to easily maintain the twist right up to the point of termination, ensuring a low crosstalk and impedance match connection. The major disadvantage of the 110 block is that it positions the contacts in a line and thus it might be a little wider than some of the custom IDC terminations. This restricts the side to side placement of jacks somewhat on the out outlet plate. Some manufacturers of patch panels have dealt with this problem by simply placing the 110 strips in two conventional rows with paired wires running to each jack. Because of the design of the wiring blocks, the 110 system is not really suited for concurrent mounting of modular jacks, as it is done with 66. However, models of patch panels uh, with 12 to 108 integral jacks are, are available. The jacks take up horizontal spaces, reducing the wire, uh, the wiring density. It is difficult to offer a 50-pin telco jack mounting on, uh, for the same reason. The 110 blocks tend to have cable attached 50-pin uh, jacks rather than integral ones. Any 110 block that is thus wired to a 50-pin jack could use any of the fan-out cables that were mentioned in conjunction with the 66 blocks. But you would lose much of the simplicity um, of the latter method. A better route would be to just use a patch panel with a 110 type connection and either terminate directly to the patch panel or wire cross connects over the 110 wiring block. The 110 system also offers a number of clip-on adapters that connect the adapter jacks, uh, cables, and other devices to the front of a 110C connecting block. Few if any of these are really practical for the orderly structure cabling. Uh, wiring approach that we've advocated for land wiring. In most cases, these adapters cannot be used for higher categories of operations such as CAT5E6. However, they are handy for testing as you can easily adapt uh, cable scanners and other testers to the block wiring. 
The design of 110 wiring blocks makes direct wall mounting without a backboard somewhat easier. This is due to the multiple rows of index strips that are an integral part of the wiring block. A 300 pair uh, block could be mounted all at once, whereas a 66 block equivalent would require mounting at least six separate blocks that would require a lot of wall, wall anchors to mount to the hollow wall. However, we are not at all advocating abandoning the backboard. It is a part of the recommended standards for, tel, uh, for TRs and is a very convenient way to provide structurally sound mounting for many wiring components. Relay jack and equipment mounting options are also available for 110 system wiring blocks. These methods are very good for large installations with the need for significant wire management. The wiring color codes are covered in detail in the earlier section on 66 blocks and are identical for the 110 block system. The length of the horizontal index strips on which the connecting blocks mount are the same 50 wiring positions as the 66 block. However, the 110 system has the added advantage of placing color coding on some of the 110 components to make uh, placing of the wires much easier. When you get a very large insulation, this can be quite an advantage as it can also be used to visually inspect the terminations for correct routing. So now we're going to talk about the Type 66M connecting blocks. The original workhorse of telecommunications termination is a 66 connecting block, as shown here behind me. Now this style of termination block uh, has been around for decades and it's, it is news for the telephone industry is pervasive. There are several types of 66 blocks, but the most common is the 66M150. Now this block has 50 horizontal rows of wire termination contacts with four bifurcated contact uh, prongs in each row. Now the bifurcated means that the contact is split in two so that the wire can be held in place by the bifurcated fingers of the contact. Each contact unit is called a clip, and the contact clips in this style of the block each have two prongs, stamped from the same piece of metal. The four contact prongs in each row are paired one, two, three, four, with each pair of contacts electrically and mechanically connected. The figure behind me shows a cutaway view of one of the contacts, uh, contact rows. Now some varieties of the 66M block have four common contacts in each row, while others have four totally independent contacts in each row. So be careful what you use. The connectorized 66 blocks with 50 pin connectors are also available. As shown here behind me, these blocks are usually manufactured with clips and may have a wire wrap post protruding from the bottom of the clip. When the assembly is manufactured, a wire is wrapped to each post on each clip with the other end connected to the 50 pin telco connector mounted on the side of the bracket. The connector may be either male or female. The contact pins of the connector are typically wired to all 50 rows of contacts with one pin in the telco connector corresponding to each row of the block. Uh, connector, uh, <coughs> connectorized 66 blocks are available with one or two telco connectors. Single connector blocks are connected to only one column of pair of contacts, while dual connector blocks are connected to both, one on each side of the block. The connectors may be used to attach pre-assembled 25 pair jumper cables or to attach a modular fan out for octopus type cable. The fan out cables, if used, come in several varieties with two, three, or four pair of modular legs, so they're not often, so they're not often, um, should say, so they are often not octo cables at all. The four pair variety fans out to, to cable six legs, each terminated in an eight pin modular plug. The legs may be ordered uh, to length, but the wire should be stranded uh, twisted pair and rated to the appropriate category in order to conform to land wiring guidelines. Now because the 66M has 50 contact rows and a four pair leg has eight wires to terminate, the eight divides into 50 rows only six times, then uh, there are six legs from the fan out when four pair cable legs are used. 
The last two rows of the 66 exam are then are not needed uh, in most pairings. So only 48 of the 50 are used. Similarly, the three pair fan out has eight legs. <coughs> uh, 48 to three and eight. And the two pair fan out has 12 legs, 48 to two and then 12. The modular plugs of fan out cables may be wired with any of the several wiring patterns, including the T568A and T568B. When ordering these fan out cables, you should specify which pattern you want and then ensure that the corresponding outlet jack at the other end of the station cable is wired the same. And uh, we will look at uh, chapters uh, 7 and 10 for more information. Uh, horizontal station cables or backbone cables are uh, routed um, down the mounting backboard underneath 66 block for termination. They're threaded uh, out through the openings in the side of the mounting bracket where they are then to be terminated. The outer jacket of the cable is removed to expose the wire pairs. The pairs are fanned out, sorted by color, and then routed to the appropriate contact. Each wire passes through one of the narrow slots in the uh, face of the block. The wires generally enter the slot that is just above the target contact row and then are wrapped down into the jaws of the contact for termination. The contact has a hook on one prong to help position the wire until it is punched down. The side slots hold the wires in place, um, in place order, although they do, uh, do not in any way support uh, or strain relieve the wires. Uh, by the way, the process of fanning out, sorting, wrapping, and terminating wires on a block is called stitching. And uh, one punches down the wire with the impact tool uh, that is equipped with an appropriate uh, blade for 66 block termination. Now the 66 has a top marking to indicate the way it should be positioned. If it is um, connectorized, the connector pins will be numbered upside down in the, uh, if the block is accidentally reversed. If the block is not connectorized, mounting it upside down uh, just looks amateurs and then you'll get comments like, hey you big fool, don't you know what you're doing? You should always punch down all the wires of the station cable even if you do not intend to use all of them immediately. It is impractical to later use the extra pair of cable if they are not already punched down because there is nowhere to terminate them. If you, for some reason, if uh, for some reason that you must install a cable that has more pairs than you generally use, such as four pair cable in an installation that uses three pair, then simply cut the extra pairs flush at the point where the cable jacket was removed. You may be able to pull the jacket back slightly before you cut off the excess pairs and then push the jacket back in place to make a neater installation. The 66M block is designed to terminate unskinned uh, solid copper conductors with plastic insulation. Conductors from uh, the AWG 20 to 26 can be accommodated and the use of the stranded wire is not recommended under any circumstances. To terminate a wire, the wire is pressed down into the slot between the fingers of the contact with a punch down impact tool as shown behind me. The tool causes the insulation to be displaced, leaving the copper wire and phosphorus bronze clip to uh, indirect uh, gas tight contact. The spring action of the tin plated contact holds the wire in place. The tool also trims off the excess wire after termination. Only one conductor may be terminated in each contact slot. If the wire is removed from a contact slot, the slot may be reused, but only if the new wire is the same or larger in size. Using a smaller wire, um, uh, using a smaller wire, using a slot repeatedly, or punching down two wires in a slot will cause the connection to fail sooner or later. Uh, as we have said, station wires are punched down from both sides of the block. Because the block is 48 usable row positions, that means that you can terminate six station cables per side of the block or a total of 12 cables per block, assuming four pair cable. On a standard non connectorized 66M block, you should punch down the station wires on the outer contact of each dual pronged clip. Some connectorized blocks uh, 
wire to the outer contacts instead of using a wire wrap clip. Cross-connect wire pairs are introduced to the row in the same way through the slot just above each contact row, but punched down on the inner contact of each clip. The cross-connect wire overlaps the station wire that was punched into the outer contact, but the color code of each should uh, still be visible. When punching, take care that the punch down tool is turned the correct way so that the excess wire uh, and not the intended connection gets trimmed. The tendency to fan the wires out and the amount of untwist that exists where the wires um, of a pair pass through the side uh, slots creates a problem for higher wiring categories such as 5E and 6. The contact clip also has a rather large piece of metal that can contribute to impedance match, mismatch and crosstalk at higher frequencies. For that reason, old style standard 66 M blocks are not suitable for use for anything above category 3. Most manufacturers have introduced low crosstalk 66 blocks that are rated to Cat 5E, but that's about as far as the venerable 66 block is going to go. Even with these special blocks, the normal wiring technique of one uh, wire per slot can still cause an unacceptably high amount of crosstalk. If the special 66 blocks are used for Cat 5E, the wire pair should be insert, uh, inserted intact through the side slot between the two target contact rows, rather than split and run through the two side slots. The wires of each uh, pair are then wrapped up or down, whichever is appropriate, into the contact and then terminated. You must be meticulous about rotating the punch down tool or you'll accidentally cut the wire we are attempting to terminate, as well as jamming the remaining stubble wire uh, that should have been cut off into the jaws of the contact. However, this method maintains the amount um, of untwist well under the half inch uh, maximum and it can help you achieve the category of operation that you seek. Unfortunately, this technique also makes uh, reading of the colored stripes on the wires difficult after termination, so you should be very methodical when wrapping the wires uh, to be sure you do not, uh, or that you do it right the first time. A subsequent termination of the inner uh, contact will make the color stripes of the wires of the outer contact of that row almost impossible to discern. Many accessories, including adapters, bridging clips, and plug-on jacks exist for the 66M block. Now, virtually all these are inappropriate for use in permanently installed land wiring systems, and the most stable connection system for land wiring is to use cross-connect wires between punch-down blocks and patches or to terminate directly on the patch and then skip the punch-down block altogether. A version of the 66 block incorporates 8-pin modular jacks into the assembly. The jacks are mounted in groups of four or so at the side of the mounting bracket. This type of block may eliminate the need for a separate patch panel. However, it is more difficult to see and access the jacks on the side of the block, and potential wire management methods are poor. In addition, you must be certain that the assembly is data grade so that some twist is maintained between the jacks and the 66 block clips. This arrangement must not be used for CAT 4 or 5 operation unless it is certified to those specifications. Several methods may be used to mount the 66M in a permanent location. Most commonly, the block may be directly mounted on the backboard. The typical backboard is a uh, 4x8 sheet of 3 quarter inch plywood securely fastened to the wall and painted of an appropriate color such as battleship gray. The 66 block assembly is actually made up of two pieces, a front block that contains the contacts and molded side slots and a standoff bracket that mounts to the backboard. The bracket is normally mounted to the backboard before the 66M is attached. Two slotted mounting holes are then located on the upper left of the lower right corners of the bracket. The slotted arrangement allows the mounting screws to be pre-installed on the backboard before the uh, bracket is mounted. This two-piece structure, bracket and block, allows easy alignment for quick mounting and facilitates the use of pre-assembled mounting frames. 
after the bracket is mounted, the 66 block is set on top and secured by four clips that are part of the bracket. Connectorized 66 blocks have the connector mounted to the bracket with the front block already attached and must be installed as an entire unit. In addition to direct mounting on the backboard, the 66M may be mounted in a pre-assembled mounting frame. A typical distribution frame is shown here behind me. The, wood, the uh, frames are mounted as a unit on two wooden backboards, although some of the frames may be mounted on a standard 19-inch 19, uh, 19 rails as well. These frames usually have pre-installed mounting bracket, brackets uh, into which the appropriate 66M block can be snapped. The frames may also have plastic standoffs, sometimes called mushrooms, and brackets for cable and cross-connect wire management. Frames are available in various sizes and can be used in, to uh, implement full, immediate, and maintain uh, in, for a main distribution facility, or an IDF. Various wire and, co wire and color codes for the 66 blocks are shown here behind me. Now the cables are terminated on the 66 block according to these standard color codes. The four pair code may be used to implement a 568C wiring system. The overall color pattern is laid out in five groups of five pair, 10 wires each. Each group of five pairs has one primary color that is the same for all pair. Now note that these are not primary colors as taught in your art class. Rather, the term refers to the first color in the pair of wires. The primary colors in order are white, red, black, yellow, and violet, sometimes called purple, and are commonly abbreviated as W, R, B, K, Y, and B, or P. Although the other abbreviations are sometimes used for uh, readability, such as WHT, red, BLK, YEL, VIO, or PUR. PUR. The first wire group, for example, has a white wire in each pair, along with the second wire of each of a different color. The secondary wire colors are blue, orange, green, brown, and slate, which is sort of a silverish gray, and they're abbreviated as well. Now note that the 568C uses these shortened abbreviations the first letter of each color, where there is no ambiguity, and a second letter where needed. For example, a four-pair cable. The color abbreviations are W, the primary color, and then BL, O, G, and then BR for the secondary colors. Each wire in a pair bears a, a helical or round stripe that is the same color as its, as its mate. The pair is referred to by its primary and secondary colors. Thus, the first pair of the first group is the W slash BL pair. Um, or what we would say is white-blue. And they consist of a white wire with a blue stripe and, then a, and a blue wire with a white stripe. The primary uh, colored wire is always punched down first from top to bottom um, of the block. Thus, the top row of the punch down block will have a uh, WBL wire, the second row would be a BLW wire, and the third row would be the WO, and then so on. Four pair are, uh, are special case because they only use four pairs from the first primary color group. Because of this, there is no confusion if the pairs are referred to by their secondary color such as the blue pair or the green pair. Just make sure that you punch down each pair's white wire first. And we talked about that in a previous chapter. That would be our tip and our rant. The 568C also allows uh, an alternative color coding for patch cords, which we'll talk about later in the next chapter. So now we need to talk about the other connecting systems. Now we'll mention two other connecting systems that are beginning to be used in more and more installations. And one is the Nordic CDT, formerly known as Nord, uh, Nortel Northern Telecom, and the BIC system, uh, or the BIC system, and the other is the Crone system. Both offer equivalent functionality to the 110 systems and significant advantages over the older 66 system. Uh, BIC connecting blocks, 
the Nordic CDT BIC system is very similar in concept to the 110 system with a dual sided 50 clip connector wafer that mounts horizontally in a mounting frame. Now unlike the 110 system, the station or feeder cables are punched down directly into the back edge contacts of the connector. Some examples of the BIX hardware are shown here behind me. Now an array of the, of the uh, BIB connectors installed in a 50, 250, or 300 pair mount forms the module. Now the modules may be mounted directly on the walls, backboards, or in racks with an optional rack mount kit. Modules may also be combined into a mounting frame to form an intermediate distribution frame, or an IDF, or main distribution frame, or MDF. Cross connects are made from the front of the BIX connector. Connectors are available uh, pre-marked or either four or five pair intervals, or at either four or five pair in intervals. The four pair version is used in most land wiring, while the five pair is used for terminations of cables of 25 or more pair. All connections are made with the BIX connecting tool, which is similar in function to the tools used for 66 and 110. Some standard impact tools can be equipped with BIX blades. Cables enter from the sides of the mount, either above or below the connector. The mounts include a provision for a marking strip or designation strip, which mounts between a pair of BIX connectors. The connectors are used in pairs with a marking strip in between. A common 300 pair mount, for example, contains a maximum of 12 connectors and 6 designation strips. Connector labels are uh, available for the 4 pair connectors in colors to match the usage group designation of the 569. Uh, and there's a table here behind me to show you, and we'll see the table again in chapter 14. Now, bridging clips are available that connect vertically between two adjacent connector positions. A special wiring fixture can also be used to assist in terminating cables. The fixture is snapped into a connector position and is moved to the next connector position to be terminated. In turn, modular jack assemblies that mount in the, in the uh, BIX mount are also available in a variety of jack configurations. The assemblies occupy two connector slots in the mount. CAT3, 5B, and 6 versions are offered. The BIX type connecting blocks are also used in modular jack outlets and on patch panels for wire termination. They are common options from there are yeah they are common options from several manufacturers. Although all of the blocks come from the Nordic uh, CDT distribution modules, jacks and patches using BIX connecting hardware may be certified for Cat 5V. Although some accessories and assemblies are certified to low categories. The usual caveats applied to maintaining pair twists up to the point of termination as with other systems. The Krona connecting blocks, um, or called Krona connector systems, as shown here behind me, features 8, 10, and 25 pair basic connector uh, modules that can be mounted in several configurations. The 8 and 10 pair connectors uh, can be installed in separate modules or module mounts that each have a capacity of 20 connectors. These mounts can therefore terminate a total of either 160 or 200 pair. The 8 pair connector is typically used to terminate two 4 pair station cables. The module mounts can be individually wall mounted or can be installed in triples in a 19 inch wall or rack mount frame. For 25 pair applications, a 25 pair connector and mount is also available. The 25 pair connector module is a feed through design with a front and back piece similar to the 110 as with the 8 and 10 pair connectors. The 25 pair connector is installed horizontally into a mounting bracket. A special assembly of two of the 25 pair connector modules is available with a mounting bracket that is the same size and footprint as the standard 66 block. These assemblies terminate 50 pair as to the 66 and are ideal for replacement of the older blocks for higher performance applications. They are also, um, they also mount in distribution frames intended for 66 blocks. The availability of 66 type mounts means that versions of the block can be offered with integral 50 pin telco connectors. 
just as for the 66 blocks. Station and cross connect wires are terminated on the bottom and the top, respectively, of a Krona connector. The connector offers a unique disconnect contact as an option. Connectors with the disconnect features can be temporarily opened for, for isolated testing to either leg of the circuit. Krona connectors may also be found in alloy jacks and patch panels for wire termination. Many manufacturers offer the Krona wire termination system as an option. The connector hardware may be certified to CAT 5B6, but again, the, use, the usual guidelines for wire power terminations have to be observed. So let's discuss routing and dressing the devices. Cabling, cross connects, and patching and wiring closets should result in an installation that is neat and orderly. Unfortunately, all these wires and cords have a, have a natural tendency to be, to be very disorderly. It's, uh, to avoid the mess and stress that it brings, you should use the proper wire management devices to put the wire in its place. Proper planning, layout, and dressing uh, of the wire and patch cords can result in a very nice installation. The process of properly rounding and dressing your cable can keep your wiring closet much more user friendly. Uh, if you are the user, you will really appreciate the neatness um, every time that you need to access your cable system. If you are the installer, your customer will be much more pleased with your installation. The system of routing and dressing, or putting everything into place, uh, of the twisted wire is pretty simple. The principle is that all the wires and cables should be run along wiring channels or trays, secured in place with cable ties or other devices. Make relatively square corners and be out of sight as much as possible when securing the wire is not practical. You can divide the wire management problems into two separate issues. One issue is how you should deal with relatively permanent wiring, such as your horizontal station cables and cross connects. The other issue is how you manage temporary wiring, such as patch cords and equipment cords. Station cable and cross connects consist of solid core wires and cables. These wires are relatively easy to bend into position, wrap around standoffs or brackets, and secure with a few cable ties. The solid wire tends to um, bend into place and stay with a minimum of restraint. The stranded wire cable used in patch cords is not as well behaved and is uh, used specifically uh, because it's so flexible. Uh, these patch cords are truly a mess to deal with, leading some to try to avoid their use in entirely and use some semi-permanent cross neck wire instead. In LAN wiring, flexible equipment cords are often used between a patch panel and the LAN hub. Many hub ports must be connected with an 8-pin modular cord, unless they are equipped with uh, mass terminated connectors, such as the 50-pin telco connector. Thus, the use of stranded wire cords may be unavoidable. Uh, unavoidable. Now, how you handle cable management will be a function of the size of your uh, telecommunications room and, and how it's laid out. If you've got a small wall-mounted wire termination system with a few wall-mounted hubs, uh, you may be able to deal with cables by securing the station wires uh, with the tie wraps and the standoffs, uh, running cross connects if there are any around standoff posts, or through cable rings and letting the patch or equipment cords uh, droop neatly. On the other hand, if you have a large facility or have equipment and wiring devices that are mounted in floor jacks, you should use a system of cable trays, panels, raceways, and brackets that rouse all the types of cables and keeps them very neat. There is nothing more troublesome than having to pick your way through a uh, curtain of patch cords to find a patch jack. Uh, there are much better ways to install your cable and cords and we will cover some of them here. Now we should caution you first that using tie wraps or cable ties that are excessively tightened can cause performance problems on CAT 5B and 6 wiring and should be avoided. However, relatively loose ties that do not distort the cable jacket should be okay. 
the effect is cumulative. So 20 tie wraps are worse than five. You can use a new type of tie wrap that made with a hook and loop mesh or a Velcro type in lieu of traditional nylon tie wraps. This new tie wrap is wider, it does not pinch the cable so badly, and it is also easily removable so that new cables can be added without adding the without adding tie wrap clutter. Standoff and distribution rings. The most basic accessories for wire management are plastic standoffs and plastic or metal distribution rings. Some examples of the standoffs are shown here behind me. And the plastic standoffs, uh, sometimes called wire spools or mushrooms, are designed to hold cables or cross neck wires underneath the outer lip, which gives it the mushroom look. Wires are wrapped over a standoff or down the side of a line of standoffs and then routed to their destination. The wire is usually bent around the post very slightly to give the wire a set and then hold it into place. Tie wraps may be used to hold wires in place, subject to precautions that are applicable to the 5E and 6 use. The standoffs are hollow and may be secured to the wiring board with a, uh, a captive wood screw or machine screw. Standoffs are also supplied without a screw. Uh, these devices are very widely used in cross-connect uh, fields especially with the 66 style connecting block, which uh, have uh, little native cable management. Middle distribution rings are often used on wooden backboards to secure station cables and cross connects as they are run across the board. Cables may be quickly laid in, sorted, wrapped, and secured to the rings. The rings are available in several sizes, although two, four, and six inch widths are the most common. The rings mount with two screws at either side. Some installers split the rings in two, uh, with a tubing cutter to provide an, uh, an open half ring uh, for cross neck wiring. This method allows more wires to be controlled than the plastic standoffs and avoids the problem of threading um, the jumper wires through each closed uh, ring as the wires are run from point to point. The half ring idea probably inspired a version of split ring or split plastic ring, also called a wire hanger or bracket, which is shown here behind me. Now this bracket has a flat solid back with side loops that almost meet at the top to form a ring. The small opening at the top allows a cable to be placed directly into the ring without threading. Now these brackets work well with stranded wire cable or cross neck wire, but the solid plenum style wire tends to work, work out the uh, bracket if not secure, or work out of the bracket if it's not secure with a rack. So now let's look at wire management panels. Wire management panels are available that mount horizontally across a relay rack or cabinet to offer orderly routing of each patch cord and equipment cord. These panels prevent cable droop that would obscure equipment from, uh, equipment from panels and connections. The panels uh, may consist of a series of splitting uh, split ring loops similar to the wire hanger that we talked about, or they may be semi-enclosed slotted raceway with a removable cover. These styles with the cover offer the ultimate in out-of-sight cabling management. They're great for patch cords, which present the greatest challenge to neatness. The covers are quite easily, easy to remove, so you can get to the cords easily for new connections. Covered cable raceways are also available for the vertical runs, although the vertical pathways are not as much of a problem. With the increased concern over the tie wraps and sharp bends when using Cat 5 e and 6 cabling, the gentle side of wire management uh, really gets a boost. Now that many in the industry have heard of actual cable failures uh, that were cured when uh, tight wraps were cut or removed, you can bet that installers will pay more attention to cable management issues. So now let's, let's look at the user equipment location. The proper location of the user equipment, such as LAN hubs, is a key part of creating a successful termination room. 
Although TR does not necessarily contain any equipment or hubs at all, uh, at least in the grand scheme of the structured wiring, your LAN uh, termination, termination room almost certainly will. Now these hubs and other equipment must be connected to the horizontal wiring for each workstation in order for your network to function. The needs of LAN hubs and other active network components are uh, a little different from the considerations of horizontal cable terminations, cross connects, and patches. Wiring and termination components simply need a fixed mounting location, wire management devices, and accessibility. The hubs and other equipment need power, ventilation, and connectivity to the respective station links. The wiring components tend to be fixed in place for the life of the installation. The equipment components, however, may need room to grow and to be reconfigured as network needs change as and as technology changes. The best location for the equipment is one that places the hubs and the wiring components as close together as practical while maintaining a logical separation of the two functions. Now remember too that some expandability of horizontal wiring connections should be allowed and that the correspondingly more room should be allowed for future changes in equipment technology. In a small installation of less than 100 terminations, uh, you have a choice of wall or rack mounting for both the equipment and the cable terminations. There are advantages and disadvantages to both. Wall mounting will give you the most free and open space in the center of a small wiring closet. However, it limits access uh, and cable routing options for the wiring components. And wall mounting of hubs and other equipment may be difficult. Rack mounting may be used um, both for wiring components and for hubs, but you will have added expense for the rack, cable trays, and other accessories. In larger installations, serious consideration should be given to rack mounting all components. This is particularly appropriate uh, with the wide range of wire management devices for cable racks. You may face an interesting dilemma trying to decide in which racks to put the hubs. Should they be in the same racks or should they be in adjacent racks? Uh, while there may be certain logic to separating the wiring termination blocks and patches from the hubs, remember that you must generally run lots of patch cords between the two. With separate racks, all those patch cords would have to pass up through one rack and across and down into another rack to make the connections to the hubs. Not only is such a long run probably unnecessary, but it may stretch you to the limit of the channel link. Remember, you're only allowed 10 meters or 33 uh, feet for all equipment cords in a channel, including both the user cords in the work area and the patch equipment cords in the termination area. If you're required a 5 meter or 16 foot equipment cord to reach to the hub, you would only have a 5 meter allowance in the work area. Now it is not unusual for large work areas and offices to, to need a 6 to 8 meter cord. So you would be better off using a short uh, TR equipment cord uh, as possible. Think of it as, especially if we're looking at our bid projects, in the rooms that have the uh, collapsible walls, since you can't put any, uh, any uh, termination uh, telecommunication ports in those walls, you may have to look at uh, possibly modular furniture. Sometimes modular furniture, you'll be running long cables inside of those. So you have to consider all of that when you're working uh, on your distances. Now, there is an easy way to keep patch and equipment cords short, um, or the easy way to keep uh, patch and equipment cables uh, cords short is to locate the horizontal wire terminations and the hubs all in the same rack. The terminations uh, might be connecting blocks which cross connects to patch panels or directly to patch panels. You can use wire management panels to route the, uh, the patch wires to the side rails and then down to the hub. Most modern wire termination blocks feature a very high connection density so they do not take up much rack space. Also, patch panels with uh, 96 
or more jacks consume very little vertical space. So it would be possible to place both equipment and terminations in the same rack with plenty of room for future expansion on both. The popular alternative uh, mounting scheme is to place the wiring terminations in wall mountings and place the LAN hubs in relay racks. Now this hybrid approach is serviceable as long as the equipment cord runs are not too long from the wall to the, to the racked hubs. In a variation to this approach, you could place the connecting block terminations on the wall, as before, and then run across or run cross connect jumpers to patch panels in the relay racks. Then, relatively short equipment cords uh, could be connected between the patch panels and hubs in the same rack. Now remember that the cross connect jumpers count as part of your 5mm or 16 foot limit. Uh, to patch or not to patch? Well, that's the question. Now you can get into considerable debate with some wiring managers of large facilities about this very question. Now there is definitely a downside to the use of patch panels in a large facility. The problems with patch panels are, they are um, that they are an added expense, provide an additional point of failure, and may provide questionable long-term connections and then add lots of spaghetti mess with the myriad of patch cords that must be used. Their modular connectors may also add unnecessary crosstalk. If connections to the hubs can be made with cross-connect wires, uh, you may be able to avoid the use of patch panels altogether. Simply terminate your station cables on the connecting block of your choice and then run a cross-connect jumper over to the mass termination connector for the hub. The larger card, card cage hubs offer port connections on 50 pin telco connectors among uh, other options. The hub's 50 pin connectors can be extended to connecting blocks such as 110 system blocks and the cross connects can be made directly to the station punch downs without using patch panels. The patchless approach has at least three disadvantages. First, Troubleshooting is more difficult, as you cannot simply unplug a modular equipment cord and insert a tester. You will either disconnect the cross-connect wire, add a user test jack adapter that fits onto the connecting block, or you must have used one of these types of connecting blocks with a built-in uh, disconnect capability, and then still use a test adapter. Second, it's much more difficult on average to locate the connections for a particular station cable since the circuit markings are embedded in the high density connecting block. And then thirdly, you may double your potential workmanship problems. For example, if you had directly terminated on a patch panel, that would be the only field termination that might have excessive untwist or other problems. The patch cords would hopefully be a will be factory terminated, carefully inspected, and certified. With cross connection, you add four points of potential workmanship problems. The connecting block, the two end connections of the cross connect jumper, and the multi-circuit termination leading to the hub. So which one is right for you? Well, that may depend on the size of your facility and the training of land maintenance personnel. The patchless approach should probably be avoided in TRs having under 100 to 200 connections unless you've trained people with the ability to do complex wire tracing and the workmanship skills to make high quality connections. Well that covers our copper wire connections, now let's look at our fiber optic termination. Fiber optic cables are treated a little differently in the TR than the conventional metallic cables. However, the concepts are still the same. Basically, in a telecommunications room, cables from the uh, horizontal distribution to the work area are brought together in some fixed orderly arrangement for interconnection to the network hubs and other equipment. Fiber optic cables may be used for the horizontal cabling in place of traditional metallic wire. Fiber optic cables are also widely used for the backbone cabling that runs between the TRs. Differences in the TR terminations fiber optic cable exists because of the nature of these signals, light, and the fact that the transmission medium, glass, requires special handling. These differences limit the number of ways the cables may be terminated, uh, severely limit routing and handling considerations, and then cause fundamental differences in the structure of the patch panel. 
in addition to fiber optic connections, uh, have what might be called polarity because a single fiber sends a signal in only one direction. A fiber optic link always requires two fiber connections, one to transmit and one to receive. To operate properly, the transmitted signal from one end must connect to the receiver port at the other end and then vice versa. And this is called a crossover connection. In contrast, metallic cable link standards use straight through wiring for most connections. This is accomplished by defining two types of equipment interfaces such as a DTE or a DC interface of the RS-232 uh, that are meant to uh, the connected terminal and communication devices. The same type of pattern exists in 10, 100, and 100 base T um, and AUI uh, devices or adapters. However, the fiber optic equipment interfaces have traditionally been identical, providing signal identification only by the label beside each of the two fiber optic connectors. That means that the user or installer must provide fiber cabling that accomplishes the crossover. The AB and BA slash BA fiber polarity orientation fiber optic cabling standards, including the Fiberscape SC and FIDI standards, specify a dual fiber connector that helps maintain polarity. The 568C method uses a polarized AB slash BA orientation of the dual connector uh, to incorporate polarity into the fiber connector. The method proposes to make the user connections foolproof so that a user never has to worry about polarity. If the fiber cables are properly installed, the proper polarities at the user connections are, in, are assured. Unfortunately, that places all the burden of maintaining proper polarity on the installer. The polarity with the SC connection uh, is achieved by using a non-symmetrical dual connector uh, body and then labeling each position either A or B as, as shown here behind me. Now the SC connector fiber uh, termination was discussed um, earlier in chapter 6. The fibers of a given cable are not literally called transmit or receive, but are numbered consecutively uh, paired and alternatively placed into either A or B position at each cable end in such a way that the transmit connector of the equipment at one end is then connected to the receive connector of the equipment on the other end. Now this is a variation of the old metallic cable proposal that would have made all equipment interfaces the same and all cables crossed over transmit and receive um, reversed at end to end. Now this is perhaps ironic that the metallic version was abandoned only to be resurrected in fiber. Now if you're accustomed to placing wire in connectors according to pin numbers and color codes, the fiber optic polarity method at first may seem a bit confusing. Don't worry, the confusion will probably not go away, it will just become more tolerable. As the figure behind me shows, the interconnection of two duplex cables at an adapter interface. The term adapter is defined as a fiber optic coupling between two fiber connectors of the same type, that is, two SC connectors in this case. The term hybrid adapter is used to describe a coupling design to make, to make two unlike fiber connectors like an ST and an SC. Now because of the narrow fiber spacing, SFF connections require an adapter capable uh, instead of hybrid adapter. Note that the adapter actually does a polarity reversal by having opposite orientations between its two sides. The A connector position is always placed into the A adapter position that passes through to a B connector position through the, parallel, uh, through the panel to the opposite side of the adapter. The end-to-end -end connections of all fiber cables are also reversed. This includes the horizontal and backbone fiber cables as well as all pass cords and user equipment cords. The pattern of reversals should be standardized in installation, but it is up to the installer to maintain this discipline. One way to accomplish this is to designate a correspondence between the fiber buffer color and a fiber number. 
then terminate all odd numbered fibers as A fibers and even numbered fibers as B fibers in the TR. Do the opposite at the station outlet. For example, in a two fiber cable, you could designate fiber 1 as A connection in the TR and um, as a B connection to the outlet. Of course, the adapters at each, each end reverse the A and the B, but that takes care then of itself. Be very consistent in your fiber polarity designations at every fiber termination. The scheme for backbone interconnection should be determined before any work begins and should be consistently applied. Remember that all fiber cable connections must reverse end to end for the scheme to work. A couple of typical fiber optic connection patterns are shown here. Now note that the scheme must have an odd number of reversals to work, but that is automatically accomplished by the fact that the coupling devices at the end of each run do reversals too. Now because cables always have the same type of male connectors, each path cord, horizontal cable or backbone cable, always provides one reversal. The adapter couplings at, at either end provide two additional reversals, restoring the signal to the original polarity. All that you or your installer must remember is where to clip each SC connectorized fiber into its duplex housing to provide the proper AB, BA orientation. SFF connectors must provide a means to maintain fiber AB polarity and cable polarity is not easily reversed. So the insulation must be checked carefully. If you do fiber to the desktop, you'll want to install a fiber patch panel in your TR. This panel will provide a point of termination for each station drop and will also provide labeling and identification for the horizontal run. It will also provide a handy point for testing and troubleshooting of fiber runs. An all fiber installation will usually involve locating network hubs with fiber optic interfaces in the TR. You will connect a duplex fiber optic patch cord between the station location and the patch panel and the hub port. You may have to use an adapter cable or a hybrid adapter if your equipment does not have the new SC connectors. All the standard cable management trays and panels may be used with fiber patch cords. In general, although you should pay particular attention that the cords are not bent sharply or otherwise stressed. The tiny glass fibers in these cables are subject to stress fractures when excessively bent and this may cause signal loss that prevents a good connection. A sharp bend may actually break the fiber uh, entirely. Suspected cords should be tested and then scrapped if they're bad. So now we need to talk about the fiber optic termination fixtures. You'll want to carefully plan the location of your fiber optic termination in the TR because of the nature of the fiber optic cable. It is difficult to re-terminate when you move the termination location. Fiber optic cable is often terminated in a special uh, fixture in the TR. Fiber optic termination fixtures as shown here often have uh, space for extra fiber to be wound. However, the extra fiber is really intended to allow some slack in case of damaged connection uh, that would need to be replaced and to assist in the termination process by allowing greater access to the, uh, to the fiber end. Usually, the amount of extra cable is only a meter or so and they may already have had the, um, had the outer jacket removed to expose the fibers. So it would not be useful uh, to use that slack in the event of relocation of the unit. The use of termination fixture, sometimes called a breakout box or fan-out enclosure, makes freestanding racks the most conventional location for large numbers of fiber optic terminations. This certainly is the case if you're using fiber for horizontal connections. The fiber is typically routed across cable ladders uh, or closed bottom trays to each rack and then down along the inside or back of a rail to the termination location. Fiber optic cables may be carried in a brightly colored corrugated plastic uh, inner duct for additional protection. 
the use of interduct is mandatory if you use unjacketed fibers or highly flexible fiber cables, such as zip cord cable. The interduct has an, an additional advantage because it is fairly has fairly rigid walls. It can be tie wrapped in place with little chance of damage to the interior fiber cables. Also, it bends easily, but keeps a fairly large bend radius because of its construction. Fiber cables can often be placed in existing interduct um, uh, much as you would in rigid conduit. Caution uh, is the watchword when you are working with fiber optic cable. Whether terminated or not, terminated fibers may be connected to equipment that emits hazarded levels of laser light, especially if using single mode fiber. Appropriate eye protection should be worn and appropriate precautions taken when you're dealing with laser emitters that transmit uh, above hazard level 1. The ANC uh, Z136.2 contains more information on these precautions. Even non-laser light may be a hazard if held close to the eye. A good rule is to never look into the fiber. The fiber wavelengths are in the uh, invisible infrared spectrum, so you're really not going to see it anyhow. So looking only suggests you to a hazard, as you cannot see the light. The hazard exists even with unterminated fiber ends. So treat them as you would uh, treat terminated fiber. Although visible light testers are sometimes used during troubleshooting, you would be safer when using these if you simply uh, uh, point a connector or fiber at your hand and look for a dot of light, rather than trying to look directly into the fiber. Bad habits are hard to break, so don't start one. The tiny glass slivers that result from cutting, cleaving, and sometimes polishing fibers are also an eye hazard. Always wear safety glasses when terminating fiber. You also don't want to inhale any of the fiber dust, but you, sh uh, but you should be able to avoid uh, that uh, when field terminating fiber cables under normal circumstances. Chapter 11 uh, will have more information on our installation practices. As we discussed for station outlets, proper identification or of TR terminations is crucial to a high quality serviceable wire installation. This includes a consistent method of cable and termination numbering. Each and every cable termination fixture, patch panel, and cross connect should be clearly identified. The EIA TIA 606 provides a method of marking just about everything in the telecommunications wiring world with wiring terminations being no exception. The guidelines call for each item to be marked with a unique identification that is clearly visible. That generally means you should use a 3 8 inch high lettering and designate each cable termination and patch position in some orderly fashion such as the TR number cable number, position, etc. Some connecting blocks make uh, marking difficult, which offers, um, which others seem to have marking panels as part of their design. Contrast examples are 66 blocks and 110 blocks. Uh, some older patch panels uh, leave little room for markings. Others, um, other than the small factory mark jack number. If in a very small installation, uh, this does not cause too much difficulty, but large installations require a more detailed exp ex um, explanatory marking. You also may choose to use color to help designate wire termination areas. The official colors uh, for grouping terminations or grouping different types of cable terminations are given in, later on in Chapter 14. Uh, and then there's a big giant specification on where all the terminations are. One of the keys to success to a successful land wiring installation is good workmanship. You can use all the finest components, the most expensive mountings, and the highest ratings, and then still have a poor installation, all due to uh, improper installation techniques. The termination room is as much in need of good installation practice as any other area in that building. In some ways, there are more places in a typical TR to do things that might adversely affect your cable link uh, than elsewhere. For example, you may make one station cable termination, 
two cross connects, and one patch termination, all on the same cable link. Add to that patch, uh, add to that the patch cords and, and other equipment cords, and then there's a lot of room for error. The first workmanship guideline is to properly route the cables, minimize sharp bends, avoid tight tie wraps, avoid proximity to magnetic fields, and then limit exposure to mechanical damage. You should ensure that the pairs are kept twisted as close to the point of electrical termination as possible. You can go back to chapter 6 for example of the effect of a slightly untwisted wire. The standards for preserving wire pair twists are defined in the 568C. Um, for CAT 5E and CAT 6 terminations, the max amount of untwist is about a half of an inch or 13 millimeters. For CAT 3, it's about um, 3 inches. The twist must be preserved within these limits uh, at each point of termination to, for connecting hardware, including connecting blocks. The practice is not good, or I'm sorry, the practice is not optional. It is mandatory. Even CAT 3 links can suffer from increased crosstalk and impedance mismatch uh, if we have an excessive amount of untwisted wire. The cable jacket should only be removed to the length necessary to terminate the pairs. This means that you do not strip back uh, uh, jacket 4 or 5, uh, 4 or 5 inches, but only about 1 inch uh, or 1 inch more than is needed for the termination of a single pair. When punching down wires in a 66 type lock, there is a possibility that another adjacent wire may accidentally get cut along with the wire that you intended to terminate and trim. The punch down tools usually have one bright yellow side with the word cut. If you wrap the wire in form of a loop of the, of the contact, the cutting edge of the blade should trim excess wire on the bottom. To do this, the cut side would then be down. If you see the word, uh, if you see the word cut, then turn the tool around so that you don't cut the wire in the wrong place. If you're using the minimum untwist technique for CAT 5 e described earlier, um, you can see the type 66 snapping blocks at the beginning of the chapter, then you must use the tool in both orientations as one wire uh, of a pair will enter its contact from the bottom and the other will enter from the top. This takes a little extra thinking and dexterity to master as you'll have to keep flipping your tool side to side. But it can be done quickly once you get used to it. Do not leave the cut off excess wire in between the contact rows of the block. You may accidentally force it into a contact slot or cause a short when terminating another wire. Neglected trimmings will also make wire verification and tracing much more difficult. The requirements of the 568C dictate a minimum bending radius of four times the cable diameter for uh, certain categories of operation. The time-honored technique of pulling the station cable very tight and bending it back to the block before terminating the wires will have to be abandoned. You should leave the cable somewhat loose if you're trying to maintain the minimum bend radius. Many new, newer types of connecting blocks have wire management pathways, clips, ties, and other devices to prevent the sharp bends in the cables. If your termination blocks do not have these accessories, you'll need to use good habits when you terminate cables to avoid problems. Remember that these guidelines also apply to cross-connect cables and patch cords. Pair twists must be maintained and the bend radius guidelines observed to maintain maximum uh, rated cable link performance. A summary of the workmanship installation rules is shown here behind me. Now that concludes Chapter 7, the Telecommunications Room Terminations. Yes, I know it was a long one. This chapter is coupled along with Chapter 8. So go ahead and get yourself a snack, maybe some popcorn, a soft drink, and then come on back for Chapter 8, uh, Patch Panels, which is Patch Panels, Cross Connects, and Patch Cords. See you.